Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. This is a public roundtable offered by the 1M1M Global Virtual Accelerator. As you know, we are located in Silicon Valley, but we work with entrepreneurs all around the world. And our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we do these roundtables every week, almost. And we've been doing it for years and years and years. This is a 332nd 1M1M roundtable. And these are free roundtables, mentoring sessions where entrepreneurs come and have an opportunity, a forum, to discuss their businesses with me. And, and often with other people as well. So this event is being recorded. You'll have the recording available in, in our uh, blog as well as on our YouTube channel. If you're following us on Twitter, um, the handles are at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. Um, we publish a lot of content through those channels. And our um, Twitter hashtag for this event is one, hashtag 1M 1M. So if you're live tweeting the show, please use that. The YouTube channel is 1M1M Roundtables. You will find tons of recordings of sessions, prior sessions over there, as well as other, you know, videos uh, of late, actually. We have done a whole body of very short, you know, 30-second video clips on various topics that are, you know, kind of bite-sized little uh, pieces of wisdom. Uh, we did it originally for LinkedIn upon request, and then uh, we published that whole thing also on our YouTube channel, so you have them in one place and can access them um, and so forth. So um, these are the call-in instructions. And we're going to have actually quite a lot of time today to do open call-in, if, if that's something that you would like to do. So if you'd like to talk to me, please feel free to uh, just let us know in public chat, and you are welcome to call in. Um, there will be also, you can also type your questions in public chat and we can dialogue that way. We do have um, at least one entrepreneur who's going to pitch up front, but then after that we're going to offer some open discussion time as well. Um, just to set expectations, uh, for all the presenters, all of you in today and in the future, you must know that we are completely on your side. This is a working session. And we are here to work on your business. And that's the only agenda for our being here with you. Um, you may disagree with the feedback you get here. That's fine. It's your venture at the end of the day. And you will make your decisions whatever way you decide to make those decisions. And um, I will give you what I think you need to hear and, um, and you're going to basically process that feedback and decide what you want to do with it. Now, one thing we see on a recurring basis at these sessions is, is kind of an obsession to raise money. And, and it's not just here. It's everywhere in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. For some reason, um, a myth has become very real and very pervasive in the industry that entrepreneurship equals financing. Well, entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues, and profits. Not all businesses can raise money. Not all businesses should raise money. And therefore, funding is optional. Exit is optional. If you raise money, if you raise funding, then you do need an exit, usually unless you have a dividend structure worked out. But generally, this obsession about, oh, I have to raise money, otherwise I'm not a successful entrepreneur, that is complete bullshit. So just know that that's our perspective, and that is, that is actually a sound perspective that you need to take into account in building your businesses. Um, now, the other thing that I would encourage you to do is if you're not pitching, please do dialogue in public chat. The most you're going to get out of these sessions, the maximum that you're going to learn is by engaging, asking questions, and dialoguing. So we offer you plenty of opportunity to dialogue, and uh, we hope that you're going to take it up. We're going to start with Guillermo Cornejo. So is that Guillermo, Guillermo, um, depending on where you're from, from Costa Mesa. He's based in Costa Mesa, California. So please unmute your line and tell us 
first tell me how to pronounce your name. Are you from Mexican origin or um, Argentinian <laughs> origin? And then I will know how to pronounce your name. Uh, my name is uh, Guillermo Cornejo. I am from Peru. Peru, Originally. okay, great. Now mm -hmm. I know how to pronounce your name. <laughs> All right, so tell us what, what you're working on. Oh, so um, I'm working on an Airbnb for motorcycle rentals, which okay. this, this means that you basically rent a motorcycle from another yes. motorcycle rider instead of going to a shop. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, Why not? So, so um, we launched in August 2016, and my, my co-founder is Brandon, and he he's a technical guy, and uh, and I'm just uh, I just came up with the idea and, and security insurance and all that stuff. Right. Uh, you hit the next slide. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the problem is that uh, motorcycles uh, sit and use even more than cars. And the average mileage in a motorcycle is about 3,000 per year compared to 12,000 for a car. And uh, motorcycle okay. rentals are very expensive. You, you can rent a car for $30 a day. Motorcycles typically cost $200 a day. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, I didn't know that. and there are 30 million people that are licensed in the United States uh, for 9 million registered motorcycles. So there's at least 20 million people that are licensed and do not currently own a motorcycle, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of potential for for this market. <laughs> um, okay. So that the so the current uh, demand is attended by traditional motorcycle rentals, but like I said, the price is extremely high, and also the service is really bad. They um, because the demand for motorcycles is very seasonal. They are. Mm -hmm. They don't have inventory during the summer, so they have to raise prices. They have to tell people, "Sorry, we don't have the motorcycle that you booked three months ago." Mm -hmm. Whereas during the winter, you know, they have too much inventory, and they, they, they don't know what to do with it. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, um, are there any other apps doing this, or are you the only one? Um, the I have a slide with the competition. Um, with a few. One of our slides shows the competition, but uh, so there's an app okay, sure, sure, using... sure. Just keep going with your slides. If you have that in the competition, in the in the later slide, that's fine. Uh, would you would you move to the next one? So yeah, yeah what what we do is is very similar to tour or get around. Uh, we connect and use motorcycles to people that want to use them. Uh, we are a little more strict in that we require people to be 25 or older with their license to have been issued at least three years ago, so to verify their experience. And we offer yeah. insurance like all our peer to peer startups, right? And we, yeah. we, yeah. Would you move to the next slide? Um, so right now we have 50 motorcycles listed on the website. And, um, we, we know we have a pretty good idea of who uh, people that are willing to rent out the motorcycle are. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, we are struggling with demand because, uh, our competitors get more of their revenue from SEO, and we are like, we're not showing up on SEO yet, so it's a, uh, mm -hmm. so it's a little difficult. But uh, but we yeah, we've been getting like uh, one rental per month, you know, and we next summer we're we're gonna spend some money on advertising and and get, and and also trying to do PR and all that sort of stuff, right? Mhm. Mm um, see the next slide. Um, so far we've been running Facebook ads and we've been featured on a few like motorcycle blogs and uh, and the local radio and uh, we we now when you google motorcycle sharing or peer to peer motorcycle rentals um we, we now appear like very prominently so it's helping us recruit motorcycle owners and and mm -hmm. we tried uh, google ads to drive them in and it's mm -hmm. kind of expensive, but more or less for mm -hmm. every dollar we spend, we get uh, two hours of revenue. So it's not that bad, but it's it's still uh, very too expensive to be profitable. Uh, but we're and did working you get on it, conversions yeah. out of the Facebook ads? Yeah, um, it, it's costing us. Uh, it's very expensive. It's costing us about a hundred dollars to to recruit a motorcycle. Uh, owner to list their motorcycle on, website, on the website, right? 
Uh, and you, and you think uh, very few yeah. people are really looking for this? It's just extra income that they could possibly make. So we, mm -hmm. we target uh, motorcycle owners that are familiar with Airbnb and car sharing. And uh, our conversion rate is about, uh, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but but it's, uh, but yeah, before we launched the website, we had like a 20% conversion rate, but now that we've actually launched the website and you, we, the customer has to take a picture of the motorcycle and upload their info and all that stuff, it's, uh, the conversion rate is much lower. Mm -hmm. Do you go to the next slide? Um, oh yeah, and we so far we've been able to we were able to secure a very inexpensive insurance policy. Uh, mm -hmm. So so far we've been able to offer a very very low prices compared to traditional rentals, and we uh, and we ask uh, owners to give discounts on longer rentals. So that's where we that's where we make the most money, and that's where we uh, save renters the most money. And this, this is an example uh, sample transaction in which. One of our guys, uh, one of our renters, saved almost seven hundred dollars. Uh, the owner made two hundred, and we and and we still uh, managed to make a, a profit out of this transaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, crap! I didn't include a competitor slide. Never mind. So uh, our competitors are uh, MotoShare in 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 the Netherlands. Uh, they. Mm -hmm. They're basically the exact same concept, but uh, they're, they're, they only serve the Netherlands, and they're in mm -hmm. Dutch. They have 130 mm -hmm. or so, or 130 something motorcycles. They're a little bit more. They're, they, they're a little bit ahead of us. They launched a few months earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, a handful of competitors in India, but uh, that's mm -hmm. an entirely different market, right? People over there mm -hmm. ride motorcycles as a means of transportation, whereas here it's for fun. Uh, yeah. Obviously, India is a much larger market usage. too. Sorry. It's a very different usage model. Oh yeah, it's a much larger market too. So I'm kind of bummed that there's already uh, a couple of startups that are successful there. But um, but yeah, I mean it's uh, there's also a a competitor that is working on uh, to launch a peer-to-peer -peer motorcycle rentals product out of uh, Mississippi, but they they haven't launched yet and um and yeah i think that's it there used to be a couple of other uh like more broad power store rentals peer-to-peer uh, -peer rentals companies but they uh they went out of business uh mm -hmm. their the main competitor is called eagle rider they mm -hmm. they focus exclusively on motorcycle rentals all across the united states and and europe and australia and, uh, mm -hmm. and a few other countries. They have uh, 70 locations in the U.S. and 115 across the world. The, the second uh, largest competitor is Harley Davidson. Their dealerships offer rentals, and they mm -hmm. uh, they offer rentals at about 160 locations in the United States. Um, okay. And then from there, it's there's a lot of uh, regional brands. For example, here in California, so there's uh, no there's dominant brand. brand. There's no brand that has, or no other startup that has pulled ahead or anything. It's it's a fairly new market. Uh, well, the motorcycle rentals market is uh, it's an existing market. Like the the dominant brand is called Eagle Rider. They're like a global brand. Mm -hmm. If you Google motorcycle rentals, the only brand that consistently shows up is Eagle Rider, uh, regardless of location. That's not a peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, market. That's a that's a they own their motorcycles, right? Correct. That's not peer to peer. Yeah. So on the peer to peer side, there's no other major player or no other even startup that has started gaining any traction. Not in the U.S. Okay. All right. So that's uh, that. That actually says two things to me. One is that the market is early, and um, you know you you have a, an opportunity to differentiate because of your earliness in the process. The other thing it tells me is that, or makes me question is that why has this, you know, everything, every people have been doing these peer-to-peer -peer, um, apps on every category you can think hmm. of. How come this category hasn't had one? And that's a, it's a question mark. 
And it's a question that you should try to answer. What do people know that we don't know or you don't know? Um, anyway, so those that's something that comes to my mind. Now, uh, on your mean, question uh, about the fundraising, uh, you want to answer that question? Yeah, um, motorcycle rentals market is fairly small compared to it's, it's tiny compared to car sharing, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. and it's also very high risk, right? People associate motorcycles with accidents and death. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know, for example, at Get Around, looked into uh, offering motorcycles, but they did not do it mm -hmm. because the insurance was too expensive for them. That's right. Yeah. So that actually is a segue into the next piece of discussion we need to have around your fundraising. You know, mm -hmm. investors do not invest in small markets. And you right. can do this business, but you'll have to do this business as a bootstrap business. It sounds like you're bootstrapping with a paycheck right now, is that correct? Yeah, but we also landed a You have small, a job. Uh, we also landed an, uh, a seed investment of $35,000 from, uh, from an angel in New York. But I, are you? Uh, do you have a job right now? Are you doing this on the side? Yes. I would encourage you to stay with that model for a while until you start figuring out the pieces of this. Because um, first and foremost, I'd like to understand. You say the market is small. What is the bottom-up TAM analysis on this market? And if you don't know how to do bottom-up TAM analysis, you need to learn to do that and create a bottom-up TAM analysis so that we can access whether this is a fundable business or not. That's number one. Number two, you're going to need to figure out the customer acquisition models that allow you to profitably acquire both renters as well as um, people who offered their motorcycles on your app. Um, and, and, and the numbers you're quoting in terms of how expensive it is to get somebody to put their uh, property on your site are kind of uncomfortably high numbers. <laughs> so, uh, so any investor who looks at this business is going to get freaked out looking at that. So we need to find much more optimal ways, much more cost-effective ways of acquiring those customers. And, um, and there are many different ways you can tackle that issue. Um, content marketing is going to be one of them for sure that addresses things like SEO, inbound, um, PR, etc. So you do need to learn how to do an effective content marketing campaign around this so that you can harness some traffic that way because um, it's going to be hard to do this with advertising and very low conversion rates, at least in the beginning. Once it starts to flow a bit and, and people start, the word of mouth starts to build up and people start talking about it, it's different. But in the beginning, it's right now you kind of need to get some, some way to a, get to a minimum critical mass of people who start transacting on your side on both sides of the equation. And we need a cost-effective way of doing that in a bootstrap mode. So in general, our experience is investors don't really invest in concepts. They invest in businesses, and not only that, these days they invest in businesses that have validation and traction. So, um, so, so those are, you know, those are the three things that you're going to need to think about. One is TAM to gauge whether this is a fundable business or not. You said yourself this is a small market. I need to understand to be able to advise you whether this is fundable or not. What does a bottom-up TAM look like? And then we need to also look at these other things like, you know, customer acquisition cost, um, rent, you know, people who are going to put the bikes. Basically, in your marketplace, both sides of the equation, how do you bring them together and, and what, what strategies can scale in a cost-effective manner? I would say those are the critical questions that we need to resolve uh, about your business yeah, before right. any and financing may be possible. So uh, you're right. And honestly, so what, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident I'm going to get there by the summer. So I, I, I'm just looking forward to start building relationships. 
Uh, for example, tomorrow I'm going to go to a, uh, I'm going to speak to a local dealership, uh, mm-hmm. motorcycle dealership, that they don't mm-hmm. offer rentals, and uh, yeah. and we're going to get them to we're going to work together to list their motorcycles on the website, and mm-hmm. and possibly change the website to make it more dealer friendly. So that's a quick way to supply inventory without yeah. And if, if dealers are willing to work with you in this mode, that would give you more reliable supplies, and it will change your business a little bit, but that's okay. That would give you supplies of uh, inventory or against which you can start transacting. So, so yes, I think if you can, if you can validate that strategy of acqu- acquiring inventory, that's a very legitimate and, and very worthwhile thing to do. Cool. And, yeah, and, and even right. though it's a small market, it's like uh, – I, th- I think it's like uh, $300 million a year in the United States alone. Um, I think that if we can achieve like a, you know, kind of like, like we're ready to attack the industry, like a near monopoly, uh, it's uh, it- it's very possible that, you know, with, uh, to, because it's transaction, it's, we-, we make so much money and the-, the-, the profit margins are so high. I think it's possible to like, be big enough for an IPO. But you were saying only... profit margins are high on, on the one hand, and you, then you're saying your customer acquisition costs are exorbitant on the other hand. How does that reconcile? Well, profit margins are not, not going to be that high if you cannot control your customer acquisition costs. That's, that's true, but the thing is, I have not been acquiring most of my motorcycles through Facebook. And I, I'm sorry if I didn't wasn't clear, but we experimented with Facebook, but it's really expensive, so we, we've been mostly acquiring mm-hmm. them through PR. <laughs> and word of mouth. Yeah, but but the, but but the point is that you're going to need to come to a point where you can scale cost effectively, and that's a very tricky equation to arrive at. You're you know you're saying when we get there and it's going to be incredibly profitable. Well, getting there can take you ten years. Right. You know, it's, well, it's true. complicated. This stuff is very complicated. So, so you're going to have to put one step before the other, one foot before the other, and, and you're going to need to figure these pieces out. And, and if you, you know, if you want help from us, we'll be there to help you. It's, I'll, I'll explain to you how to use one and one m in a moment. And, um, you know, but, but basically you're going to, I think the dealer strategy I like a lot. If you can get, get a bunch of dealers to work with you and, and that becomes your supply of inventory, that's fantastic. I think that would be, a very helpful way to uh, move this thing forward, but then you still need to acquire the renters, and that's that's still an expensive proposition until you can find <laughs> ways in where you can sell uh, scale cost effectively. Okay, so Guillermo, good luck. Yeah. Hang on, and you can ask more questions about uh, how to use the program if you choose to use the program. I will explain that in a moment. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Folks, um, I would like to actually go to Q&A uh, relatively quickly, um, and it's going to be a slightly shorter session than usual, but let me explain to you how to use 1M1M, and then we can go straight to Q&A. And if you like, by the way, what we do in 1 million by 1 million, please refer the program to serious entrepreneurs, people who are willing to do what it takes to build a business. And, uh, and that's a lot of work, a lot of commitment, a lot of, you know, blog by blog business building, and, and it's hard. It takes a lot of nerve. It takes a lot of time commitment. So that's just the reality of entrepreneurship. It is not some glamorous business. Entrepreneurship may sound glamorous, but it's not exactly a glamorous thing. It's, it's something that you kind of have to work through, and, and um, you know, <laughs> it's hard. So resources-wise, if you look to 1M1M as your accelerator, as your you know, partner, thought partner, learning partner, etc., you're very welcome to use all the resources we have on deck here. Everything starts at 1MBY1M.com. You'll find a ton of material. You'll find a great blog, which is free, and you can start learning from that. It's inspiring. It's educational. It's powerful. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series, there are 12 volumes of those. You can find all of them on Amazon Kindle. Each of them have 12 to 16 case studies and, and delve into a topic. You can use those to learn as well. These roundtables happen every week. 
So come back to the roundtables, listen to the recordings of the roundtables, another great learning uh, strategy. Uh, we have a premium program, which is our full acceleration program, where we offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a curriculum that is case studies and video lectures based. We offer you help with business development, strategy consulting on your specific project. You get methodology and project-specific strategy, both. And then we also help you with financing and media relations. As we were just talking about media and PR being a very important piece, both social media as well as other kinds of media, um, being very important in customer acquisition as well as investor acquisition, actually. Social proof is really important for investors uh, and customers. So we can help you with that. We have a huge uh, community. We have you know, our community is over 300,000 people, and we can get the word out on your behalf. And when you're ready, and we will help you get ready, if you have a fundable business, we will help you get ready for a financing round. And when you're ready, we will introduce you to investors. So all this is part of the full acceleration program, which is 1M1M one &one Premium. And that's the $1,000 annual membership fee. I encourage you, all of you, to go do the 1M1M one &one self-assessment. This is a free questionnaire. These are questions you should ask yourselves. Investors, if you go face investors, they will ask you these questions, and you will need to answer them. For a, you know, the higher the certainty, higher degree of certainty, the higher degree of authenticity and confidence with which you can answer these questions, the more um, impact you're gonna have on investors, and the better you're going to do in your business. So I suggest you ask these questions of yourselves and not wait for investors to ask you these questions. Now, in going through this, if you decide that you need help with methodology, these questions will, you know, take you through all sorts of issues that you may not have training on. Yes. You can plug that methodology training gap by going to 1M1M one &one Basic, which is the curriculum only option in the 1M1M one &one program, and you can learn methodology there on your own, and it's, it's a very inexpensive way to bridge your gaps in uh, methodology learning. So go to the website. There's tons of material about our programs, both premium and basic, and as well as all the free resources. Um, dig around, there's lots of video FAQs that should answer pretty much all the questions you might have about the program. The curriculum is split into core and electives. The core has seven modules, bootstrapping, positioning, market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. And the electives are across various parts of the industry, Web 3.0 and e-commerce, cloud computing and business solutions, healthcare, IT, et cetera, et cetera. There's a full range of electives. And these are all case studies and video lectures-based programs, um, modules. And we've had over 700 successful entrepreneurs participate in developing these curriculums and these case studies. They have brought in their lessons from the trenches, their experience, their advice, and you get to stand on the shoulders of over 700 successful entrepreneurs whose case studies and whose wisdom is built into this program. Our methodology is lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startups. Even if you want to raise money, you're going to have to bootstrap first and raise money later. That is just how the industry operates. And then, as I said, we have a lot of media cloud. We are able to generate media coverage for you. Go to the press page on the website and you'll see some coverage of premium members. We also do extensive social media propagation of your messages if you're part of the premium program. Upcoming free roundtables, one more left in December before the holidays and then all through January we have free roundtables. So sign up to pitch or to attend and we look forward to working with you. Um, these are the conference call-in ins instructions for now. So we are ready for Public chat questions, make sure you set your public chat to send to all participants or questions by dialing in. So you're welcome to dial into the call and ask questions as well. So let us know who has questions. And while you're thinking through your questions, let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson. 
Irina at 1M by 1M.com. Any questions about the 1M 1M program, just reach out to Irina and she'll help you work through those issues and questions. Anybody? Questions, comments, introductions? This is a great time to introduce yourself. We love to network with you and you want to network with one another within the room. So there are tons of people in the room. Please feel free to introduce yourselves. Tell us what you're working on, what kinds of issues you're facing, where you're dialing from, etc. Maureen is providing a popular question from Quora. How does a bootstrap startup compete with heavily funded ones? Well, um, and this is a very interesting question. We have case study after case study where people have done this successfully. So I will answer your question with a fantastic case study. Hotel Planner is a bootstrap company that is now doing over $25 million a year and is the market leader in the group travel and hotel booking sector. When they started, they had numerous heavily funded competitors who were spending money like there is no tomorrow, but they were not focused on fundamentals. Fundamentals meaning customers, revenues, and profits. So when the market crashed, they could not, these other competitors who were basically dependent on investor financing and they were, didn't have a robust customer and profitability scenario, they could not keep on raising money. So one after another, these guys all went out of business. Hotel Planner was slow and steady, executing with a fundamentals-oriented approach, and in the end, they emerged the winner. So you can read this case study. Um, there's a case study on the blog called Bootstrapping to 20 Million with Intelligent Financial Engineering. Tim Henschel is the name of the CEO. Um, so if you do a search on that, you can, and you can go to Quora also and, and find this answer and the pointers to the case study, as well as um, Tim was at this roundtable a few months ago and, and um, you know, had, we had a chance to listen directly from him about this case study. So definitely uh, you have opportunities to learn from somebody who has done it before and done it very, very effectively. And that's, by the way, our methodology of teaching is we bring people on who have addressed a certain problem or followed a certain strategy and, and successfully navigated through the challenges, and then we bring them on to the forum and have them describe how they've done it. And the whole curriculum is full of these kinds of case studies and people that you can learn from. Okay, Harshul Gupta is asking how to combat the situation when you're a non-technical founder heading the technical startup. Well, you know, there are a lot of non-technical founders who have successfully built technical startups. You will need to, you have two options. Either you have to hire somebody who is a strong technical person and you have to know how to manage that person, or you hire a technical co-founder, um, whichever way is fine, um, but, but one or the other scenario has to be, or you can, by the way, the other third option actually, um, I don't want to miss that, is you can outsource your development. If you can spec out, scope out what you're trying to build, at least from an MVP point of view, you can use outsource development as well. Um, folks, if any of you would like to call in, just let us know in, in the public chat that you're calling in and I'll know to call for you. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Harshul, did I answer your question right? Maureen is providing another question from Cora. Is it possible to build a billion dollar company without funding from a VC? Yes, it's very much possible. Uh, Zoho and eClinical Works uh, are two case studies that we have in the program that we are very, very fond of actually. These are both very successful companies. Both of them are completely bootstrapped. No outside money whatsoever, not one penny of outside funding. If they went public today, each of them would be worth probably, you know, more than, I would say at this point, probably five billion market cap because these guys are on track to do a billion dollars in revenue in 2018. So this is now in the end of 2016. So they're, prob they're at around $500 million in revenue, and, and with those kinds of revenues, and, and hugely profitable, they're easily, you know, they're generating 20% profit or more, 
And these are, you know, as a result, the PNL is very strong, very, very high market cap. So these, if you were to value them, they would be, you know, billion dollar market cap companies easily, much more than that, multi-billion dollar market cap companies. And they're 100% bootstrapped. The, the curious thing about this, and, and what I find fascinating actually, is that um, these companies, both of these companies that I talked about, Soho and A Clinical Works, the founders have no desire to go public. They have no desire to sell. You know, they just want to continue building their companies and adding value to their customers, and they just love what they do. And I just love these two founders. I'm, I'm friends with both of them. One is Girish Navani, who is the founder of eClinical Works. The other is Sridhar Vembu, who is the founder of Zoho. And they're, they're really inspiring people to learn from. So definitely look up their case studies. And we've had, um, you know, we've had uh, Girish at the roundtables. We've had numerous case studies, numerous interviews with both of them on the blog. So there's, we have a lot of um, input from them for many years now. They've been quite close to the program for many, many years. Anybody else? Harshul is saying he's tied up with the technical firm. That's good. That's definitely one of the three strategies I would recommend. Anybody else? Questions, comments, introductions? You guys haven't told us where you're joining from. Tell us where you're joining from. Tell us what you're working on. What is your project? Very shy today, Maureen says. Yes, it seems like it. Very quiet. Or are you guys all getting into the holiday mode and don't want to spend too much time dialoguing on business? Well, all right, in that case, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. If you have questions about the program, um, definitely reach out to Irina Patterson, and uh, she will help you with whatever questions you might have. Harshul Gupta is saying that in the long run, we'll put sourcing out technical uh, – sorry, I, this sentence doesn't I – don't, I don't understand what you're trying to say with this sentence. What are you trying to say? Something is wrong with the English grammar in your sentence. If you could write it in, in, a, in a way that I can understand, I, I can weigh in on, on what you're commenting on, Harshul. Are you saying in the long run you don't want to outsource your software development? And that's, that's a reasonable strategy. You can do the minimum viable product and then you know, get the business validated and then start building a, an in-house team. That's something that very, very often entrepreneurs do. If that's what you're saying, then I agree with that strategy. Any other comments, questions, introductions? If not, we're going to wrap up the session, and uh, we'll see you back here next week. And for the last time this year, and then we're going to resume in, in the new year. So I hope you have a good holiday plans and have a chance to recharge your batteries. And uh, we'll, in any case, we will keep working with you for, for a long time to come yet. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for coming today.